Today, we'll be talking about invasive species, focusing mostly on examples in and around Lake Erie. This lesson was created by Jackie Hyenall and Mariah Thrush as part of Ohio University's NSF-funded Boat of Knowledge in the Science Classroom. Watch the video, Lake Erie Legacy Aquatic Invaders, Disrupting the Balance. When watching the video, think about the following questions. What are invasive species according to this video? What kind of invasive species are found in Lake Erie? What can be done to prevent the spread of these species? Pause the video after watching it and discuss. The Great Lakes, they are one of the world's great natural resources, almost 20% of the world's surface fresh water. And they have multiple uses from recreation, commercial, and it's, it's critically important to how we use the Great Lakes to be able to manage them in a constructive fashion. And when you have the invasive species coming in, they dramatically alter the food web. Well, aquatic invasive species encompasses a whole host of individual organisms, including fish and zooplankton, uh, phytoplankton, uh, even plant species. Basically, it's an organism that isn't um, historically native, so it isn't in that location, hasn't been in that location, and it was brought over either accidentally or intentionally to a new aquatic ecosystem. There's no upside to them, but they introduce a lot of uncertainty into the system. Well, because the invasive species have uh, dramatically altered the whole food web, structurally changed the food web and how, it, how the energy carbon is cycled in the food web, which has implications for fisheries management, um, water quality management, and we've had um, many, many nuisance problems. Basically what I do is I assess how those organisms impact the behaviors of native fish, and not just the behaviors, but maybe diet, um, where they live, so their habitat. The goby that I work with, it impacts smallmouth bass in the way that they forage as young individuals. And so if gobies are an uh, intense competitor um, during the egg and, and juvenile stage of smallmouth bass, that'll impact the number of catchable fish that are in the lake. The impacts that these individuals have on the ecosystem force us as managers to kind of change our resource management strategies and tactics to try to minimize the impacts of these guys on other aquatic uh, species. If we control non-indigenous species into the Great Lakes, we will have better management practice because the systems will be more stable. And that's the problem right now. They've just changed so dramatically and so fundamentally with sometimes the introduction of certain invasive species that makes it very, very difficult to manage. And, and that's why I think we'll have, you know, we'll have better fisheries, we'll have better water quality. Well, individuals can do a lot to minimize the introduction in particular of aquatic invasives. And once that fish outgrows, outgrows your aquarium, don't, don't set it free in the lake because it's a potential aquatic invasive species if it finds another individual or a few individuals to, to reproduce with. You could establish a reproducing population in the lake. Making sure you clean out your live wells um, for zebra mussels and quagga mussels, it's good to wash down the side of your boat if you're going to put it in one water body and move it to another water body. We really want to geographically isolate the lakes. We want to, you know, anything that goes on in the lakes, we don't want to transport out of the lakes. Anything from another place in Ohio, small inland lake, whatever, we don't want to transport um, into the great into Lake Erie. The most important thing that people need to recognize, and I think often we, we lose this perspective living in the Great Lakes, we take them for granted. But they are truly one of the world's great natural resources. First, we need to distinguish between native versus exotic species. Native species occur naturally within a region without human introduction. Exotic species, also called non-native species, are introduced into a region by humans outside a naturally occurring area. This introduction could be intentional or accidental. It's important to recognize that non-native species are not necessarily invasive. Non-native species could bring positive impact but it's more likely there will be a negative impact to the introduced area. Sometimes differentiating between non-native and invasive species can be difficult, but a diagram can make it easy. The larger green circle represents non-native species, and the smaller blue circle represents invasive species. Notice that there is space where the circles don't overlap. That space represents species that are non-native, but not invasive. The invasive species circle is totally enclosed in the non-native species circle, meaning that all invasive species are non-native. A simple way of stating this is that not all non-native species are invasive, but all invasive species are non-native. As with most concepts in science, there can be exceptions to the rule. 
There are very few rare documented cases of native species becoming invasive, but this is due to environments being altered. For our purposes, we will consider these situations outliers and focus on non-native invasive species. An invasive species can be defined as a species that one, is non-native to the ecosystem, and two, is capable of causing environmental, economic, and or human harm. The National Invasive Species Council defines invasive species as an alien species whose introduction does or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. Notice that the issue of invasive species is serious enough to have a government council dedicated to the problem. We'll be breaking down this definition to look at the economic, environmental, and human health problems invasive species create. Invasive species can harm the environment in a variety of ways. The first and most obvious problem is that invasive species displace native species. The round goby seen in the lower picture has outcompeted other small bottom-dwelling fish species in Lake Erie. Hybridizing with native species blurs the line between two species and can cause reproductive problems with the native population. Altering ecological factors means that an invasive species can change all sorts of traits within an ecosystem. One of the most visible changes is altering habitats to suit its needs. The zebra mussel in the upper picture not only displaces native mussel and clam species, but it also covers every underwater surface it can attach to, altering the habitat for many species. Invasive species can also be carriers of disease and parasites that native species have never been exposed to. This means that native species don't have any immunity or other defenses against new diseases, making it more likely to be fatal. Some invasive species can be health problems to humans. Watch the video on the attack of the giant hogweed to see how this plant is dangerous to humans. This impressive plant originally came from China to Europe as an ornamental. It made its way across that continent and was brought to BC. Since then, it has spread like the blackberry. On the North Shore, a dedicated team hunts down the giant hogweed, hoping to eradicate it before it is completely out of control. You may not realize that you've been burned until a day or two later. Um, it, it slowly comes out, it's uh, photophytodermatitis. Photophyto so it, it, when you get the sap on you, it reacts with the sun. I think what happened with me is I was fully covered. I think when I took my gloves off, it got onto my, onto my skin. Two days later, I could see red, redness on my arm. Um, three, four days later, there was a, a real distinct burn. It was blistering and it can scar. It can, it can leave a permanent scar. If you do get the sap on you, they suggest immediately soap and water to try and clear, clear it off. In most cases, people don't realize the danger of the plant or the fact that they've actually got the sap on them until a day or two later. The sap is found in the stalk, stems, and leaves. Once exposed to sunlight, it becomes toxic. The skin reddens and blisters. After about a week, the skin develops a dark color which can last for years. The plant is particularly dangerous for kids who use the thick stems for telescopes and pea shooters. Okay, so I've got this, this specially made tool because you want to be as far away from the plant as possible when you pull it down. To take the plant down, you need to have the blade at an angle. If you try and cut straight across, it doesn't work. So I'm going to cut it down. It's going to fall. And then I'm going to remove this, the seed heads and put them immediately into the bag and then cut it, cut it into smaller pieces, put it in a bag. And this bag here will go into the landfill, not into the green waste, because we don't want the, the plant spreading. It's important to be completely covered as much as possible, but the sap or from the plant can cause blindness. So goggles are really an important component of this whole suiting up. Uh, what we're trying to do is determine if we are actually getting on top of this whole hogweed battle. And we're mapping through the city. We GPS where the plants are. And we're putting together the actual square meters of area in North Vancouver that has the hogweed problem. And we have noticed a reduction. So if you do find one of these plants in your yard, avoid contact with its sap and have it removed. 
It's best to call a qualified professional, but if you do remove it yourself, make sure that you're covered from head to toe with water-resistant protective equipment, since that sap can really burn. Invasive species can cause problems for our economy as well. When we talk about economic damage inflicted, we focus on problems in agriculture. Invasive plants could outcompete crop plants or invasive insects could destroy crops, like the marmorated stink bug eating peaches in the upper picture. Invasive species also increase the cost of upkeep of structures, whether it be roads, railways, shoreline structures, or military installations. Invasive species could affect structures with overgrowth or destructive behavior. In the lower picture, you can see how a pipe can become closed by zebra mussels unless it's cleaned frequently. Successful invasive species possess one or more traits that allow it to easily invade habitats. For the next four slides, we'll talk about common traits seen by researchers. First, invasive species are prolific, meaning there are many individuals and they tend to reproduce quickly with large amounts of offspring. The zebra and quagga mussels in Lake Erie are incredibly numerous, covering every possible surface, including pipes, boats, and living clams. Successful invasive species can be easily dispersed by people, wind, water, or wildlife. Asian carp were imported to the U.S. originally for aquaculture. They escaped into waterways, and they can be dangerous to humans and destructive to habitat with their jumping and flailing you see in the picture. Invasive plants and animals tend to grow quickly. For plants, they can also leaf out earlier than native plants, getting more sunlight and shading out native plants. Not only are zebra mussels prolific, but they mature and grow quickly. Have you noticed that zebra mussels possess many of these traits? When an invasive species comes into the new ecosystem, they have a higher probability of being successful when there are no natural controls on the species. This means that the invasive species probably doesn't have any predators or disease in the new environment, so it can grow and reproduce without natural controls. Invasive species can successfully invade a wide variety of ecosystems, but there are ecosystems that are especially susceptible to invasions. A major disturbance, like an earthquake, tsunami, or volcano, can kill many native species, creating vacancies in the ecosystem that invasive species can fill before native species can move back. Low biodiversity can also allow invasive species to move in easier. Look at the low biodiversity diagram on the left side of the slide. If an organism at the second trophic level experiences a drop in population levels, invasive species could enter into the ecosystem. Then the predator's food source will be affected. Alternatively, the invasive species could outcompete the native species, once again causing problems for the predator. In comparison, high biodiversity, diagrammed on the right, is more resistant to invasions. If an organism in the second trophic level has problems, other native species can fill that ecosystem role, causing no or minimal problems for the predator and making it more difficult for invasions. Added fertilizers and pesticides, especially from agriculture or golf courses, can harm native species, making invasion easier. Mesic conditions typically require minimal specialization from invasive species entering the ecosystem. It's kind of like a Goldilocks scenario. Not too hot, not too cold, not too dry, and not too wet. Mesic generally refers to the moisture level of the soil. Xeric is minimal soil moisture, as in deserts, and hydric is high levels of soil moisture, as in wetlands. Newly established vegetation, or a forest in the early successional stage, can be susceptible to invasion. If you think about it, 
Earlier successional stages tend to happen shortly after major disturbance, which you already know to be a susceptible condition for invasions. Therefore, invasive species can still take advantage of an ecosystem just starting to recover. As we've discussed, disturbances in the initial early stages of ecosystem recovery can be a susceptible time for invasions, so ecosystems recovering slowly would create a larger window of time for possible invasions. Major disturbances, like a volcano pictured below, take a while to return to conditions before volcanoes, especially if other anthropogenic problems are occurring. Invasions have a general pattern that researchers have documented. This diagram shows a typical invasion with time on the x-axis and area invaded or infested on the y-axis. Phase one is called establishment. This is at a time when the invasive species is at a low rate of spread and probably has not been detected yet. This phase can take a few years or several decades. If invasive species are detected at this level, then eradication and prevention measures can be simple since there are relatively few invasive individuals occupying a small area. Phase two, called expansion, occurs with a large increase in the rate of spread, bringing about detection by researchers and land managers. Public awareness can also occur during this stage, though not all invasive species receive public recognition. Eradication and prevention is still possible in this phase, though it becomes more difficult as the area infested and the number of individuals grow. Phase three, called saturation, is a phase no one wants to see. At this point, the rate of spread starts to level off because the maximum amount of possible area to invade has been reached. At this rate, eradication is rarely an option. Control and management at a local level is the only option. Unfortunately, the zebra mussel has reached phase three in Lake Erie, but we can each do our part to prevent other invasive species by cleaning any objects that have been in a body of water before entering another body of water, not moving firewood long distances, and not planting non-native species without advice from land managers or researchers familiar with the area.